So I just want to say welcome. I'm Jamie Seward, Associate Director of Lifelong Learning with the Office of Alumni Relations here at Johns Hopkins, Hopkins University. Um, before we proceed, I would love to acknowledge our sponsor, the Hopkins Biotech Network. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, Sam Ball Brown. Sam did a lot of work to pull this together. So round of applause for Sam. He is a vice president at MTS Health Partners LP. He is also an active member of our Hopkins Biotech Network and a 2010 graduate of the School of Arts and Sciences. He was instrumental, as I said, in putting this together. So it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Sam. Hi, great, and thank you so much, Jamie, uh, and for everyone uh, else uh, for their participation tonight. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get some more folks trickling in, uh, but in terms of, you know, the genesis for this started last year during the pandemic, we were just trying to think of ways to uh, bring the biotech community together, facilitate some introductions, uh, and, you know, it's, I think it's working. Um, you know, for, for me personally, uh, have gotten to meet some really interesting Hopkins uh, affiliates in the biotech space all around the world, so from California to Portugal. Um, so uh, hopefully, uh, over the course of the evening, uh, we can meet some interesting people. And uh, with that, um, you know, apologies, uh, Jamie. I, I thought I thought you were doing the introduction uh, to to our our keynote speaker here. Um, oh, just the sequencing. Yeah. So no uh, problem. I can totally. I'm happy to do it myself, guys. I have oh, no perfect. qualms. Okay. So I'm Basil Dahiat. I graduated from Johns Hopkins. Uh, I got my bachelor's in biomedical engineering in '90 and my master's in 92. I stayed a couple extra years to keep working in the lab I was working in. It was a biomaterials lab um, by a professor. Uh, his name was uh, Dr. Cam Leung. He then moved on to Duke. Now he's at Columbia, very successful guy. I then, after I got my master's, I went and got a PhD at Caltech in chemistry, where I worked in protein design and engineering, specifically working on developing computational algorithms that we then, um, pressure tested in the laboratory by designing, synthesizing or expressing, and then characterizing the proteins that we'd engineered and using that to feed back into our design algorithms. And then helped spin out a company based on that technology in 1997 called Zencore. I still work there. Here's, our, here's how it, it looks. That's our old logo from a jacket 20 years ago. Um, got our Luda logo here somewhere. Uh, I'm in my office right now in the Los Angeles area. I'm about five miles east of Caltech right now. Um, so that's in Pasadena. I'm in a town called Monrovia. So the, the, the sort of journey I've had for the last 25 years in biotech was starting out um, when the industry was very young in 1997. It was about a decade in as a legitimate industry and seeing it grow into this, you know, massive part of the U.S. economy. I remember um, when I started, the buzzword was Merck is bigger than the whole biotech industry by market cap and sales, right? Now there are several biotech companies that have a higher market cap than Merck, and there are um, dozens of ones marketing their own products and dozens that are profitable. And it's grown to include companies that service, companies that discover and create drugs. It's grown to include um, you know, an entire industry of, of novel diagnostics. So it's a big industry. Personally, I, I helped start the company and became the CEO and then started raising money from private family offices and venture capitalists, helped develop the underlying technology and, and patent estate. And really the most important job was finding talented people who were willing to work, um, to work at Zencore. A lot of challenges being off the beaten path in LA, not one of the biotech hubs like San Francisco or Boston, though that's changing rapidly. Um, and I learned a lot about how to, how to survive and raise capital um, as a private company for 16 years, which is not, it was a very long time as a private company and developed a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, experience um, doing partnering and licensing transactions with large pharmaceutical companies. And then we went public in 2013, had an IPO, and um, we've been growing ever since now, also having access to, to public capital. We're about 250 people. We have also an office in Del Mar where a lot of our clinical operations and regulatory affairs are. We've got, I think, seven programs in clinical trials right now. 
and there are three marketed products that we either created or licensed technologies that are incorporated into the molecular sequence of um, uh, an autoimmune sort of a rare, rare autoimmune disease drug sold by Alexion, now AstraZeneca, called Ultimiris, um, Citrovimab, the, the last antibody standing against the Omicron COVID variant, and um, a, a lymphoma drug called Monjuvi. And there's different success and failure stories embedded in those. So I'm a biophysicist, but I really haven't done science hands-on for two decades. But all I talk about all day is science with different constituencies. So I wanted to sort of give a few remarks to kind of frame my experience and, um, and, and you know, go from there. That's why I didn't, I didn't want a formal introduction with a bunch of degrees and stuff like that. I thought an introduction about what I might be able to actually have cogent commentary on would be more useful to you. No, that, that, that's perfect. And uh, thank you so much uh, for, for the context. And uh, I'll start off with a, a couple of questions just to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, you know, certainly the elephant in the room is the NBI. Um, you, do you have, uh, kind of as a CEO and as, as a scientist, necessarily you have to think long-term about uh, innovation. Uh, but do you have any strategies? Do you, do you look at it every day because it does matter for certain strategic decisions, or is it something that you kind of block out and and think about uh, your own catalysts and the, your own pipeline? Uh, you know, thinking about the longer term impact for your equity story. Yeah, versus for the us, you spend the vast majority of your day thinking about the long term issues in your company and operating your company, management of your clinical trials, you know, engaging with the people who, who work at your company doing the usual kinds of things like performance evaluations and, and, and compensation reviews and, and things like that. Um, you're always aware of that in the background and that level of awareness of things like the biotech stock market index and the, the capital raising environment in the moment, your level of awareness of that will fluctuate enormously by, by orders of magnitude, think log scale, based on your particular needs, your company's particular needs in the moment. If we were running forward towards the need to finance in the near term, whether we were private or public, by the way, based on our cash position, how much runway we have left of burning cash before we run out, and the key milestones we have scientifically that would drive the desire in investors to invest. If we were looking at, invest, at financing in the next six months, I'd be watching that thing every day and more importantly, I would be talking to people in the market constantly, the capital markets, people at banks and investors, right? Now, we don't have any issue around that. We have a, a very strong balance sheet and we have a, a capital and we have revenues coming in from the, the various pieces of our business that we've built around licensing and technology access around our core of drug development that it's not a worry for my company right now. That said, I'm probably talking to investors at least in a at least weekly, maybe more, maybe less. Like just yesterday, there was a, a a biotech healthcare conference put on by a bank, Guggenheim. It was an oncology day, and you know I had six or seven meetings with investors, and I had a fireside chat with a analyst. And so obviously, I'm cognizant of what's going on over the last few months because I want to understand the mindset of the people I'm having a meeting with. Right, I'm trying to tell them how great Zencore is, why they should buy our stock because of the full fantastic clinical trial catalyst we're going to have, et cetera. The way you position that is going to vary based on, you know, are these people hemorrhaging money out of the side of their head, right? Or is it flush? Is money just free and easy for everybody, right? So, so I, I frame it that way. Um, you know, if, if the only reason you're working is to try to maximize the amount of money you make and the speed with which you make it, you should not work in biotechnology. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm turning red in the face. I'm hearing that because uh, I am I am a banker, so <laughs> potentially guilty. But I mean, again, uh, yeah. let's be clear. Bankers don't work in biotechnology. Oh, no, exa exactly. Right? No. They work in the financial <laughs> services industry yeah, and they yeah. service biotechnology. That's Absolutely. great. It should all be money for you. You should not worry about anything but money. Oh man, it's just uh, a, a bit philosophically challenging to uh, to have such an accurate statement. But uh, but so going to one of the uh, the differentiated aspects of uh, of Zencor uh, and talking about that, one of the reasons you have a strong balance sheet is that simultaneously, while you are have elements of a traditional biotech uh, and the commensurate, you know, you, you want good data and raise 
equity off of good data, of course, but you supplement that with more of the pick and shovels play into the, with the licensing agreement. Um, you know, was this a strategic decision that was from the genesis of the company or were the, the, was the strategy to outlicense some of the underlying technologies more opportunistic and now you have the combined business model and uh, I, I guess, how did that sequence in terms of- I, I would say it that it was, um, it, it grew out of something fundamental to the start of the business, which was we, all, we always wanted to create intellectual property that could block or enable um, people to develop molecules, novel molecules. We're engineers, we were engineering novel molecules. We weren't discovering things out of a genome or out of a cell proteome or whatever. I remember in 1997, we didn't have the human genome sequence yet, right? There were people saying there were 200,000 genes in the genome and half of them were going to be drugs. So if I could sequence it first, I'm a winner. Now that all ended up not being true. We didn't know at the time. It could have been true, right? So we were taking a different approach, an engineering approach. And so that was always the, the basis of it. And we thought that that IP would be valuable, whether it was for making our own drugs or doing work for others, hard to say, right? Um, back then, we thought we could just charge people for sequences and we'd make lots of money as an IT type company. That lasted for about three months before reality hit, right? People want things that work, not things that they can check if they work, right? So, so I would say that there was an element of that, that core intellectual property creating new amino acid sequences piece, right? But the, the, the drive to use that to create a licensing business emerged almost accidentally from a killer application of this protein engineering work, which was engineering the constant regions of monoclonal antibodies. So antibodies have hypervariable regions that vary, you know, the tips of the Y, when they bind whatever they're going to bind, and the, the rest of it's sort of scaffolding that people had ignored for many years. And by the uh, early 2000s, we stumbled across an application of engineering that component, which is a plug and play unit, right? IgG1s all have the same FC region. If you manipulate them to engage, you know, NK cell receptors better or to have longer half life, which is where that's determined, you can use it again and again. That then we stumbled into this licensing model that allows us to have a much more flexible financial approach. Um, and you know, it, it gives us the ability to create new drugs that have differentiated features, which is how you're gonna drive your market cap from you know, where you are today, where whatever you can get is from cash flows to the sort of open-ended growth if you have a great drug. Uh, those, and those, those great drugs are coming from great IP and the great IP is coming from great people. Um, you know, the the thinking about being in LA, you know, is it, is this a kind of San Diego North that you pitch it or LA as a hub for attracting uh, top scientific talent? Uh, is it, you know, starting to reach that critical mass where some of the secondary hubs that are emerging around the country and, you know, is LA going to be the, the next spot to, to look for, uh, to, to move if you're a, a PhD biochemist? I would say that we've always had an ample supply of excellent scientific talent in LA. What we've been missing is a supply of people that know how to operate in the downstream of that in biotech, which is in product development, right? Whether it's GMP manufacturing, whether it's, 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 it's a bioassay development when you're doing actual clinical assays and clinical samples, clinical trial management, regulatory affairs, those business, and then sort of the, the, the the ancillary business pieces, right? The finance pieces, the general management pieces. We were missing that part. The science we've had in, in spades. And remember, LA County is 10 million people, right? LA County plus Orange County is 13. You go a little bit east where half of my, my, my coworkers live, you add another five, 18 million people, right? That's a massive region. It's country-sized region. So we were dismissing the specific pieces. And so we don't position it as San Diego North. The, 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 the big upswing for Zencore has happened in the last few years when more – the gr industry has grown so much, biotech specialists start trickling into L.A., then we can really lever up. Great. And, uh, you know, to open the floor a bit, uh, Ned, I see that you've got your hand raised. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, I was just uh, trying to sneak some work in and multitask while we were listening to the introductions, and uh, it's a great story. Um, Ned Jaster, my work at Agilent technologies in the Boston area as a senior product uh, marketing manager in the life sciences, primarily catering to the immunotherapy space. Uh, my questions really are twofold. One, um, you know, I, I was thinking about how I was going to phrase this question. And often in our strategy groups, we're constantly talking about build, buy, and partner. Uh, and you've introduced the license uh, part of that model and referred to that a couple of times. Um, and I'd love to hear kind of how you um, 
how you surveyed that landscape uh, and decided on that in, in a little bit deeper. And then secondarily, um, if, and might be good for the audience uh, is, was there ever a time, and it sounds like there was, when you had to pivot to adopt a new business model and perhaps mentioning you know, a few of those challenges uh, sure. that you needed to recognize and overcome might, might also be useful for the audience. Absolutely, absolutely. So first your question is, the build buy or, 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 or license or, or borrow or whatever, um, I would say we, we fortuitously stumbled into it. We developed a great technology for making cool molecules by engineering FC domains. In and of itself, if that was not a multi-use sort of molecular widget, we would not have been able to do this licensing model. And I want to make clear the word licensing, like think software license. We allow somebody to use this, this engineered domain that we have, and they just pop it into their expression cassette and off they go. If, on the other hand, we'd come up with a super clever technology for making fully human variable domains, right, like many companies have done, the only approach there is actually a service approach because every single use, every every program you license for or every partner who wants five programs, your labor is going to go into doing that. And so you become a service business, right? That's a different model. That's like an Atomab. I'm sure you're familiar with those guys or like uh, an Absolera for making antibodies. The FC domain was literally make it once, do it again and again, and you know, just sell it off again and again. The same exact FC is in multiple market products, multiple, um, multi and we have a family of them, different, different functionalities you can dial in. That was a lucky thing, that it happened to be that the science we got to work had that feature. So you chase the science a lot of the case, right? Because if that doesn't work, you got nothing. So I would say that was very lucky, and that, that just created a very unusual business model for Zencore. I would say the only correlates that come immediately to mind are like the pegylation technologies, where one peg, many drugs, um, and things like that, but did very distinct from say if you were creating novel variable domains or if you were you were really really good at at at, at medchem right where every project you've got a lot of labor a lot of fixed cost we have no cost for our deals which is what lets us really focus on being a, a drug development company now going to the second one have you had to pivot business model based on um, you know tough times yes right in two thousand and four we were kind of hitting a little bump from the big raise we did in 2000 during the bubble. Our valuation was definitely getting crushed down by the next round we were trying to raise, and we needed to get some deals done. And this licensing model, getting multiple deals done, relatively small money, but no marginal cost for us was important. And then I would say the other driver of switching models is we got on our feet, raised some money, start developing some interesting preclinical candidates, and then the bottom fell out of the economy in 2008, right, the Great Recession. And money dried up. And by 2011, when we were getting a couple molecules to the clinic, we couldn't finance it. Like there was just no money. So we had to partner things that were, these were going to be molecules. We've licensed RFCs. We'll do that. But, but drugs we make, we're going to take all the way or die trying. Well, we couldn't. We had to license in phase one, two assets, one of which is now marketed um, because we needed, we needed somebody else's money to do it. And we needed money, frankly, just to feed ourselves. So we licensed one to Amgen, one to this German company called Morphosis. So that was a pivot of business model based on capital availability. And that happens all the time in our industry. Great, a uh, couple more minutes here. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, so I'm uh, Joe Varelli, uh, PhD candidate at the School of Medicine, also a graduate of the Master's in Biotech program through the Krieger School. Um, so my question is sort of piggybacking off of Ned's in that, uh, you know, you say it's, it's, you know, low or zero cost, but how much of that is you going out and seeking those uh, technology licensing agreements? And how much of it is people coming to you and saying, you know, we think that your technology would be useful? Um, because, you know, presumably if you went out and evangelized it and sold it, you could increase your licensure revenue um, by some amount. Right. In the early days, we had to yeah. do a lot of that, right? The first few years, but then it just gets out there and it's people come to us. I think the limiting factor is less the sales push than it is the identification amongst these big partners that, okay, I've got a portfolio of 11 products I'm developing. I think they're all great. Which one of them needs that oomph, right? And that's the bigger barrier. It's not invented here barrier more than anything else. So the first few years, it was a lot of effort, but what does that mean? It means a full-time business development guy calling people, going to conferences, and some of your scientists going to conferences presenting. It, it's, it pales in comparison to the effort of building out uh, a project team to run a collaborative research project. Yeah, 
and I, I have used some of your FC uh, oh, good. modified antibodies. So Great. thank you for uh, thank you for being. Here. Great, and I think we've got time for one more, Jim Montgomery. Yeah, thanks, Basil. Uh, we we had some time back in uh, in April of 2019 at AACR. Uh, and amazing to think what's happened between then and now uh, with with everything going on that's obvious. My question in this, firstly, congratulations on Alexianomorphosis and the work there with your bispecifics. It's fantastic. H how do companies of your size, of Zencore size, move post-COVID forward? It, it, and and what 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 are the success factors that you're looking at to say okay um, we we there there's you know talent is in a different place they used to be in one location now they're distributed mm -hmm. uh, money is distributed et cetera is, is there kind of some thinking going forward of you know what's the success map yeah I think the work mo working model is going to be hybrid work is here to stay and you want to attract people to come in as much as possible. Good environment, flexible hours, minimum requirements of being in. Um, that's absolutely going to be the case. You do need to yeah. be together in a creative business, and biotech's a creative business. But if you're doctrinaire about it, you're toast, right? I think it's, it's as much as anything, companies our size, sort of that small to mid-cap company, has to figure out a way to scale a little bit, but not lose the ability to communicate very effectively internally and make decisions quickly based on good information. Because yeah. if you don't, you're just like a big pharmaceutical company, or frankly, a big any organization, but without the, without the, uh, the resources, right? It's very easy to slide into that when it's not right. just a group of five people thinking about everything, making all the decisions, doing all the work. Even at a, once you get past 150, you're in that, you're in that realm, and you've got to work very hard to maintain openness, flexibility, and speedy communication. Yeah. So I think that's going to be the recipe for success. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, and Basil, thank you so much for your time today. Thank uh, you. Really, uh, uh, really enjoyed hearing you speak, and thanks everyone again uh, for the questions.